Well, good morning. A little scheming going on in that movie. A little George Clooney scheming. You know, you know who his was his aunt, right? Was Rosemary Clooney? You don't care. This whole side, this side cares. You guys are the caring side today. I want to thank you for being here. I'm just kidding. I'm glad you guys are here too. Most of you. My son's over here, so I can't be totally grateful. No, I'm glad you're here too. It's good to see you guys this morning. So, you know what this is, right? By the way, my insurance agent really is watching online. That's not a, that's not a joke. That's, that's actually happening right now. There's no battery in this. No battery. No. Later, maybe. So, uh, this is a very specific design that they have for tools, and they've added to help you out. If you look at from something from the 20s, you won't see this, but on saws today, they have this. Do you know what they call this? A guard. Why do they call it a guard? It's trying to protect your fingers. And my dad, when I worked construction, didn't like me using other people's tools because a lot of the contractors wanted their life to be a little bit faster, just a little bit faster. So they would take off safety precautions off of every tool and make them super dangerous. My uncle included. My uncle took the guard off of his radial arm saw and lost four fingers. They put one back on. So he could do this. But every time I saw my uncle, all I could think was, that's what the guard's for, right? Now, here's the deal when it comes to temptation. We all have squirrel brain. All of us. Come on, you've been driving and you, you don't do it. I hope you haven't done it. But you've been driving and thought, just, just, I could just easily just bump them off. And I do think having a bumper lane in the middle of the interstate Instead of that lane at I-4 where you pay extra to go faster, that ought to be bumper car lane. And when you get frustrated enough, you go to bumper car lane, and then you just take it out, and then you get back on the regular highway. You've wiped a couple of people speed racer style out, and you, you're good to go. Now, here's the deal about life. We all, all are tempted. We all struggle with temptation sometimes, and I'm going to show you, and I want to look today at the story about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, and we're calling this the inauguration, which means the beginning, but how did it start? Jesus is baptized, we talked about that last week, and then it says he goes out and he's tempted. And so today we're going to talk about this idea of temptation and how the big deal is, listen, just like the guy's taking the guard off, Everybody, every temptation is about shortcuts. Every temptation you have is about, it'll be easier if you just give in. It'll be easier if you just don't do this. It'll be easier if you just drive a little bit faster. Come on, we've all done the math going to North Carolina. Let's see, 75 will get me there at this time. 82 will get me there at this time. 145, I'd be there in like two hours and there's only one person in the wor this room who's driven 145, and he's already been up here today. <clears throat> he didn't deny it. Plausible deniability. He's straightened his ways. So today we're going to talk about this idea, uh, and there's three ways that the enemy tempts us. I, I think there's more than this, but these are three ways that Jesus was tempted. And what you're going to do with these questions so often will determine, listen, you can give in to temptation. And can I tell you, for a short time, it's cotton candy. It's satisfying. Uh, the Bible says stolen fruit is sweet, right? And so it's sweet for the time, but then basically it becomes poison. It sounds really good, but then all of a sudden we recognize, oh no, what have I done? And so it's always this push for a shortcut. And in our world where Christianity is supposed to be about surrendering to God, we live in a world that tells us, don't surrender to God, surrender to your feelings. Surrender to your emotions. Surrender to your desires. And it's gotten to the point that if you say to somebody, surrender to God, don't surrender to your desires, they say, what kind of hate speech is that? 
it's really gotten that bad. And so I'm here to tell you today the Christian life is about surrender, which means that even a desire like bread, which seems so silly to us, if God's called you to not eat bread, which in Jesus' case that was what was going on, then you're supposed to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. I want to challenge you today to not only resist the temptations that pull you from God, but also to get a way to overcome it. And I'm going to, in the middle of this message, I didn't do this last night, but I'm going to give you some practical ways, because I was just thinking today, what are some things that have really helped me when it comes to certain temptations in my life? What are some things that have helped me? So we're going to look at that. But let's pick up the scripture here. The question of identity is our first point today. The question of identity, which you might want to call pride or humility. By the way, humility uh, uh, is not, um, does not look different sometimes than pride for some of us. Because the truth is, if all you're thinking about is yourself, that's not humility. If all you're thinking about is you, even if what you're thinking is, I'm a low down blankety-blank, worthless, blankety-blank. That's not humility. That's actually self-centeredness and a form of pride. So let's look at what happens here in this story. Matthew 4, verse 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. By the way, who is God who would allow us to be tempted? The same God who would tell the disciples cross over to the other side of the lake knowing that a storm was coming. Why would he do that? God allows things in our lives sometimes. Why? So that his power can be made perfect in us. The Christian life is not about ease and comfort. I wish it was. I would love to tell you, you become a Christian and I could write a book called The Best Life Now, right? You become a Christian and you just have the best life. Well, that's true spiritually and maybe even emotionally. But the truth is, when you follow Christ, you may suffer for your faith. And so it says here that he was led or God told him or sent him into the desert to do what? To be tempted by the devil. And then it continues. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I get hungry after an hour. I tell Kristen all the time, because she says, are you hungry? I go, that is not the question. If I ever say, I'm not hungry, you should say, what's wrong? If the answer is, no, I'm not hungry, either we just ate, and I ate way too much, and can't fit anything else in. I mean, I'm hungry after Thanksgiving dinner, often, okay? If I'm hungry, it doesn't take me time. 40 days, Jesus is hungry. He's got a desire. He, he wants to eat. And then Jesus, uh, uh, Satan comes to him. The tempter came to him and said, listen to this. This is the identity question. Satan actually asked this first word twice. He says, if, if you are the son of God, what's he doing to Jesus? He's saying, are you really, are you really who you think you are? See, the enemy will come to us and and we feel like we need to prove ourselves. Maybe it's with other people. You ever have to be right? I was thinking this morning, one of the fasts that I might need is a need to be right. I love to be right. I love to be right. I hate to be wrong. I hate, oh, I hate to be wrong. I love to be right. I love to tell people when they're wrong. I love to mention when somebody's wrong. I like to read the post on Facebook where they point out that somebody else is wrong because that just makes me feel more right. Isn't that weird? What is that? It's me trying to prove that I'm important. And that's what Satan is doing to Jesus. Are you really who you think you are? And my answer would be, well, I'll show you. Bread. You should say, I was making wine for mom when I was four. By the way, we're assuming that Jesus had done the wine thing before his first public miracle. Why? Because the first thing that happens is Mary goes, do whatever he wants. I've seen this one. It's awesome. <laughs> right? So he says, if you're the son of God, right, prove yourself. Tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. God. It's just bread. 
That's one of the things that, that sin says to you. And by the way, this is the way the enemy works. The enemy comes to you and goes, that sin's no big deal. The IRS won't know. Your spouse won't know. That employee won't know. That employer won't know. It's not a big deal. And what the enemy does, he tricks you into any sin. And then after you commit that sin, he says, how dare you do that? You're the biggest idiot there ever was. Nobody else has done something so dumb. He first tells you it's no big deal, and then he convinces you if you fall that it's the worst thing you've ever done. It's amazing how that works. Imagine Jesus physically hungry. Prove that God has given you power. But Jesus emptied himself. How do I know that? Listen to what it says here in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Basically, he could have made anything happen at any time. When Jesus was on the cross, he could have looked at one of the guards and said, death. At any time, Jesus could walk on water. Imagine what that would be like. Just any time Jesus is going around, he just goes across. People would hate swimming with him. Right? And yet, he didn't use his power to his own advantage. Rather, what did he do? He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. What did he do? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. One of the best ways to obey God is to recognize surrender is what the Christian life is about. Surrender takes humility. In war, people put their arms up. Why? To say, I'm done. I'm done. I've done everything I know to do. I'm done. I surrender. In the Christian life, in church, sometimes we're singing a song and people raise their hands. By the way, some people have no idea why they're raising their hands. They just saw somebody do it, so they thought. But it's a sign of surrender. Raising your hands is a sign of surrender. God, I give up. By the way, too often... Uh, uh, I heard somebody say this this week, and I thought it's so true. Too often, all we're doing is reading the words of songs. We're not really surrendering to what God wants us to do. Sometimes we're just busy singing the notes, and we're not really taking the songs and making them into prayers of our hearts. Surrender is about saying, God, I can't do this, but you can. I mean, most of us don't get to that point until we're in, like, the hospital, or we're dealing with somebody. We have a teenager. It's amazing how many teenage parents have the best prayer life of anyone in the earth, right? How's your kid doing? Uh, I saw somebody last night. I said, oh, they haven't reached the sullen stage yet. They said, at church. Uh -oh. By the way, not a nice thing to say in front of a teenager. That's my squirrel brain. You know, one of the things in us, we want to exalt ourselves. So we want to be right. So we want to prove ourselves. And sometimes we prove ourselves to others by showing how they're wrong. Other times we do it by gossiping about them. Other times we do it by making ourselves feel better about ourselves than them. It doesn't even have to be anything complicated. Everyone thinks they are the best driver on I-95. That person going 45 in the left lane thinks, well, I'm teaching everybody else a lesson. Right? And what are the thoughts that go through your head? See, that shows how our pride just swells up inside of us so often. Angry driving, cussing people out. By the way, one of the reasons, and I worked on, uh, in construction, so I heard a lot of profanity as a child. My, mo my mom every once in a while will say, well, your dad never cussed around me. And I always go, ha, 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 My brother and I discussed which, was his, which were his favorite words. All of them have four letters, right? We heard things that mom never, right? So we, we knew how that was. She's watching online. I'm in so much trouble for that comment. But why do people cuss? Because they're trying to control somebody else. They're trying to prove that they're tough, so they blankety-blank. Ah, get back to work. Why do we yell? Why do we scream? Why do we fight, verbally or physically? Because we're trying to prove ourselves. We're trying to control others. And too often that's based on pride. Because Satan comes to us and goes, ha, they think they're better than you. 
And we go, I'll show them bread. But our bread is our language or our power or our control, our ability to manipulate somebody. So the first question is this, do you know who you are in Christ? Because if you recognize that you're a child of God, <laughs> if you recognize I in myself, I'm broken, I'm messed up, I'm a squirrel. I go for seed anytime I see it. There it is. But with God's help, I'm an overcomer. With God's help, I'm his child. When we really understand who we are in Christ, we don't have to prove ourselves to others. And here's the deal. When you don't feel like you have to prove yourself to others all the time, you can actually love them. You can't love people when you're trying to prove how important you are to them. And we all know somebody who's not good at that. Right? Somebody who's always trying to prove themselves to others, but they're so obvious about it. And we're like, they're so obvious trying to show off. But the truth is, if we're honest, we all do that. We're just better at it than that guy. Number two, the question of trust. Do I trust myself or do I trust God? You ever do the trust fall? That was real popular in the 80s. You know, you would, somebody would stand and everybody was supposed to catch them. I had a youth pastor that thought that wasn't enough, so he would stand the kids on the front of a bus. You remember that youth pastor, don't you, Bill? On the front of a bus, he would stand them up on the front, the hood, when buses had hoods. He'd stand them on the front of the bus and have them fall into the youth. And I remember thinking, no way. I do not trust those other students. It only takes one going, whoa. Oh. Too often, because we've been hurt by other people, we don't want to trust God. We're afraid that God's going to let us down, going to fail us. And so what do we do? We trust ourselves. We think, I know how to do it. I can do it the best. But if we're all honest, haven't you ever let yourself down? Haven't you ever decided, I will not eat a Girl Scout cookie? Ding dong. There's 12 Girl Scouts at your door. We had too many. We're giving them away. 42 boxes. Thank you. Right? As soon as you try to overcome something, what do you do? You even fail yourself sometimes. Let's just be honest about it. So listen to the next test. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Now, the temple was already high, and then you added the temple, and the temple mount to that was even higher. You could see all over. And he says this, if, once again, here's the if question, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he'll command his angels concerning you, and they'll lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. What was Satan doing? Satan was saying, if you really are powerful, show me. Jesus answered him. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Does God really love you, Jesus? Does God really care about you? Well, then throw yourself off and see what happens. There's a scene in the original ancient Superman where she doesn't believe Clark Kent. She's not sure. She thinks Clark Kent is Superman. She throws herself out the window knowing that Superman will save her. And he basically pretends he's not Superman and has her fall slowly to the ground. And then she yells at him, I guess you're not Superman. Too often, Satan's tempting us to say, does God really love you? Does God really care about you? Can you really trust God? And what Satan does here is he actually takes God's promise out of context. He, he pulls a verse and kind of takes a little piece out of it and says, this is what it really says. People do that with God's word all the time. Does God, does God really say that? Well, that's just your opinion, Eric. It's so hard sometimes to trust God, but the truth is we oftentimes don't want to deal with the negative things as we go through life. We want a shortcut. Satan was looking at Jesus going, there's a shortcut. Just throw yourself off the temple and God will show you. No, that's not how it works. You know, one of the ways I want to encourage you to, to trust God is to get in relationships with people. 
Because there's, there's two commands, love God and love people. And here's what happens. When you get in a relationship with people, guess what happens? By the way, we all feel really good about ourselves until we talk to other people. And then we see the motivations of our heart. If you get around anybody, there's going to be a time you get aggravated. Everyone except my wife. Never aggravated with her. However, if you get around anybody after a while, what's going to happen? You're going to see imperfections in them. You're going to, your pride will sneak up on you. And so one of the things about getting relationships is for sandpaper. Do you work with somebody who's fun to work with? And by fun, I mean horrible. You ever work with a boss who is a jerk? I had a boss who used to use big words so he could manipulate other people. What was funny is he didn't know what the words meant. That's absolutely a true story. He was a principal of a school up in Titusville. And he would say words. And I remember one time I questioned him. I said, do you mean? And I defined the word. He got so angry with me. But I felt right. Do you see how it works? I felt like, well, I know better than he does. <laughs> What was he doing? Same thing I was doing. Too often it's hard to trust God when life gets hard. Would it be nice if there was a shortcut? It's these times where we have to trust God that we have to say, God, I'm tempted to not obey you. I'm tempted to not surrender to you. God, I am tempted to try to do this my own way, even though your word says that that's what's right. I, Lord, it'd be a lot easier if it was this way. Oh, just give in. The angels will protect you. Just give in. Do we trust God? That's the next question. By the way, when you're having a hard time with trusting God, I want to give you just a little practical thing. Next time you're having a hard time trusting God, give Him thanks for the t things He helped you make it through. So that time where you're sitting in the hospital with somebody who's not doing well, Say, God, I don't know how this one's going to turn out, but I know in the past you've helped me. Just think of times that God was there for you. Remember the times that God walked you through difficulty. Remember the times that God helped you as you struggled. Why? Because when you begin to thank God for what he walked you through and his power, guess what? You begin to trust him again. God, I don't know how you're going to make it through this one. But it isn't amazing. You're all still here today. Most of you. Maybe not mentally. Physically, you're here today, right? And so the truth is, God has helped you to make it this far. So you've walked through some things. Well, take some time to thank God for that. Now, I want to give you some practical, some things I wrote down on a three-by-five card on the way here this morning. Just some practical temptation guides. Here they are, okay? When you're dealing with temptation, when the squirrel shows up and says, just do it. It's no big deal. Just give in. Just give in to that temptation. Just do that thing. Here it is. Number one, God, I surrender to you. God, I'm, I, I love what AA says. I'm powerless. God, without you, I'm powerless. So I'm surrendering that temptation. I'm surrendering that difficulty. By the way, when I'm talking about temptation, some of you have one that you've always had, and you may have even gotten to the point that you just say, well, that's just how I am. Well, then you've really given in to the enemy. It is not how you are. You're a child of God. He's transforming you. You don't have to give in to that temptation. But Eric, that's what I want to do. I think Jesus was pretty hungry. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit that's in Jesus gives us the power to overcome. But God first, I surrender to you. I am powerless to overcome this. The second thing, avoid, envir avoid environments when you, where you fail. I can remember being in high school and I had a friend that became a Christian. <laughs> he became a Christian. He said, I'm going to go to the party that I used to party at and witness to my friends. And I said, I don't know if that's a good idea, dude. A few days later, he came to me. He goes, hey, that wasn't a good idea, dude. You know what I did? Let me guess. You got drunk. How'd you know? If you struggle with alcohol, you don't need to be going to bars. Some of you may need to get rid of your phone because of the things you look at and the things you say. Avoid environments where you know you're going to fall. Things that you've not even had the discipline to overcome yet, at least for a time. 
The third thing I said is to redirect your mind. How? That's why Jesus used Scripture. Scripture's really powerful. I want to encourage you to find a verse. If you struggle with anger, I want to encourage you to look up a verse on anger for you that you, when you struggle with anger, that you can say. If you struggle with lust, I want you to look up a verse. You can just Google the word Bible lust. That may come up with some weird things. Okay, never mind. But, but look in your Bible app. <laughs> And, and, and whatever word it is that you're struggling, maybe you're struggling with trusting God. Look up trust. And ask God to give you a verse. Print it up. Write it down. Put it somewhere. Why? To redirect your mind when you go through that struggle. I want to encourage you to get in a small group. Get with someone who you can say, I'm struggling. It's got to be somebody you can trust. It's got to be somebody that you have a relationship with. And so what do you got to do? You got to build a relationship first. You got to spend time with somebody. Get in a place where you can say, I'm struggling. Would you pray for me? Now, can I tell you that you won't be sinless? I know that's going to be a shocker to some of you. When you fail, confess and repent. But don't stay there. When you fail, fo go back to focusing on surrender. Because it's easy to fail and then focus on yourself. Instead, Focus on surrender. God, what do you want me to do? By the way, sometimes if you'll help others with the thing you struggle with, you'll find that you'll do better. Teachers tell me all the time, when I teach something, I learn it. So for some of us, if we would help others through their struggle, guess what? God's going to help us walk through that same, same struggle. This is what C.S. Lewis says. A silly idea is current that good people... Do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. Last point, number three, the question of priority. Am, is, am I going to do what's easy or am I going to be obedient? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Notice he doesn't ask him who he is this time. All this I'll give you if you'll bow down and worship me. Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. We so often want the shortcut to life. We want comfort, we want convenience, we want what's easy. We want to give in to any desire that we have. But when we do that, when we go against the plan of God and we say, God, I'm going to do what I want to do, we will struggle. Satan was trying to convince Jesus, hey, you don't have to go to the cross. And Jesus finally said, hey, I'm going to follow God regardless. I'm going to do God's plan, not my plan, not your plan. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step of forgiveness, the first step of walking with him is to surrender your life to him. Not just knowing about Jesus, not just understanding him, but surrendering to him. So if you want to do that today, you want to give your life to Christ, I want to encourage you after the service, I'll be here and you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and you have a temptation. As I talked the whole time, you thought, this one's it. This is the one, oh no. I want you to begin to surrender that to the Lord. Don't just give in. Don't just say that's how I am. Say, God, I surrender that to you. Don't just say, oh, I'm an angry person. No, you're not. God, I'm surrendering my anger to you. God, I'm surrendering my unforgiveness to you. God, I'm surrendering this area of my life to you. Would you help me? We're going to have a song to finish our service and our time of giving. You give what God's put on your heart. If you're watching online, you can give online. Thanks for being here this morning. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength. I thank you that you love us. Father, we're all tempted, but you said you would never allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able, but with the temptation will give us an escape. So Lord, I pray we would know how to surrender to you, to look for the way out, but Lord, also to walk in your power. Thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen.